I write that? Okay. Ah, shalom, Israel. How are you? Okay, so where's my clicker? All right, so this is, by the way, just bear with me. This is the first time I'm doing my own clicking and stuff like that. So if I click off, just, you know, help me out. All right, have patience with me. All right, so I'm going to take you on a little journey today. And it's a journey um, that will show you how some brands have recently used inspiration um, to lead to innovation and eventually some great brand transformations. And I'm going to share this with you through a slightly unique brand perspective, mine. Uh, now, most people don't think of themselves as a brand, but we are all brands. And just like the great brands we're going to share with you today, each one of us has a unique perspective. We each have our own set of attributes that, you know, sort of differentiate us from each other. And like many great brands today, each of us uh, is capable of innovation and transformation. So whether you're talking about big brands or everyday people, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's that, that inspiration that leads to innovation uh, and, and that, you know, if you are innovative, or at least think that way, you too can uh, innovate. So, I'm going to practice what I preach, and I'm going to make this journey a little bit personal uh, by introducing you to my brand along the way, and to kind of like sort of show you some of the ways that I express my brand and how I inspire myself to innovate. So, okay, I know this is like really basic, everybody, but I just want to, so that we're all on the same page, I kind of want to, you know, start with something very simple with like the definition of a brand. So, you know, a brand is um, a set of beliefs, <laughs> it's a promise, it's an emotional connection uh, between a company and a consumer, or maybe between a network and a viewer. And a brand is, is well, it's, it's, it's not what you say, but how you make the consumer feel when they think about you. Now, um, you know, as I talk today um, uh, about branding and innovating, uh, I'm going to use words like, um, like you and your company sort of interchangeably because all the same rules apply. Like, I could be talking about you the same way I could be talking about your company and, and that sort of thing back and forth. So, um, so something to think about as I go through this pr presentation today. Um, um, think about things like, well, you know, what is your brand? Uh, how are you memorable? And what do you want people to think of when they think about you? Because how you look, how you move, how you sound, and of course, your beliefs, those are all your brand. So if you were to ask me, um, you know, what my brand is and, and my attributes are, I would say bold, fun, cool, responsible, um, you know, bold because, you know, I like taking risks and being innovative, and a little bit edgy, fun, I like to say I'm a little fashionable, current, provocative, cool, entertaining, funny, I hope to God, once I get rid of my nervousness here, um, and responsible, inspiring, and passionate. So I I'm going to give you a little example of this. So I live in New York City, right? And this is, you know, again, I want to just kind of talk about how I live my brand every day. I live in New York City, and, you know, I don't like to drive, and I don't like to take the subway. It's boring, you know, to go to work every day. So instead, I fly to work on a three-wheeled, futuristic, motorcycle, tricycle, and pretend that I'm a badass superhero from another world, ready to take on the New York City traffic. I mean, think about it. It's bold, it's fun, and it's damn sure way cool. <laughs> so I truly believe that boredom can lead to inspiration, and inspiration can, of course, lead to innovation. So, I, I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, for me, I, my day is packed. I go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, and it gets really, 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 really boring. So, like, how can I make this a little bold? How can I freshen it up a little bit? How can I add some excitement to this? So, I don't just walk to meetings. I mean, I ride. <laughs> so, of course, riding a unicycle at work is fun. It's cool. It's efficient. I get to my meetings faster. I get to the bathroom faster, <laughs> and I get my exercise in. 
You gotta crank the volume a little bit now. You know, this is my song. I'm feeling happy. Thank you. <laughs> so every day I can't wait to get to my next meeting because this is just the best way to get around the office. My boss thinks I'm crazy, by the way. <laughs> so yes, when it comes to great branding, um, you know, whether you're talking about a person or whether you're talking about um, uh, a brand, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I have a very, very simple theory on this, that um, you know, every day you have to ask yourself, what will I wear today? <laughs> Most people don't even think about it. But for me, getting dressed is an art. My body is my canvas. It's my first creative thought of the day, my purest thought of the day, uninhibited by what people think and what they might say. Each day, I open my closet and my mind to all the possibilities of self-expression. How do I feel today? Who will I be today? What will I say today? My birthday suit is all I got. It's what God gave me. Sure, sometimes I wish it were different. You know, bigger, stronger, sexy. Oops, what did I do? Damn that clicker. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Help. <laughs> leaner, oh, there you leaner. Go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if it were perfect, I think I'd walk around butt naked just to show it off. But it's not perfect. So instead, I dress it up. My fashion inspiration comes from everywhere. What I see on the streets in New York, on the runway, in the clubs, in the magazines, the movies, and then I make it my own. My hair, I love it. I miss it. Man, I did everything I could do with it. My waves, my naps, my curls, my colors, my braids, my dreads. I was like a lion with a mane so strong. They called me Black Jesus when I had locks so long. But nature, <laughs> had other plans. Yeah, I miss my hair. Hell, what man wouldn't? Given the chance, who knows what I'd do with it. Now, you might wonder how I went from this to this. Well, my love for getting dressed started way back. <laughs> Not that far back. But I can tell you I was styling and profiling from the first day of kindergarten. After graduation, I dreamed of being a model. But when I took my pictures around, they told me I wasn't European looking enough. <laughs> That's probably because I wasn't. So I said, fuck it, and went into TV. Where else can I wear what I want to wear and get paid for it? So. <laughs> what do you want to be today? Well, the brilliant team of Johnson & Wilberton found that question to be the inspiration for the transformation for Steve Madden Shoes, which is gonna be our first stop on our journey to brand innovation. Now, one of the most iconic fashion brands in America since 1990, the, vis the vision of Steve Madden Shoes was to represent what's hot, what's next, and what's exciting for women's shoes. To give sort of that fashion forward women uh, a, a unique way to express individuality. The problem, well, they hadn't had a consistent brand strategy for years. And, and they had not even done any advertising in 12 years. And when they did advertising back in 2001, it was just weird. So now it's 2013. You've got this very successful retail brand. Their digital is exploding, yet there was no consistent brand voice. The brand was just following trends with no unifying theme to market them. So what was exciting, though, about for the shoppers was that going into the store was like going into a candy shop. There was something for everyone, every style, every trend, and it all depended on what you wanted to be. So, who do you want to be today became the brand promise for, uh, for, for the creatives. 
And, and so that brand promise was the inspiration which led to the transformation of Steve Madden shoes. Now, bear with me for a minute here and check this out. So instead of trying to shove them into a box, shoe box, get it, get a house, shoe box, okay, uh, into a box, they embraced the idea that you get to decide every day. And for some women, you get to decide three and four times a day. From what you wear, say, to work, to a romantic dinner out, to looking sexy at a club, you get to have it all. Like, they used this empowering statement to connect with their consumers throughout the day. The brand became all about reinventing yourself and reinventing yourself over and over and over again every day. from fashion to television on our journey about brand revelations and to our next stop, Comedy Central. Now, Comedy Central, this, this is a network, by the way, that's near and dear to my heart because so the network came to Israel, I think, in 2011, I think it was in January, and, um, been, but it's been part of the U.S. Uh, since 1991. And so I want to just give you a little bit of backstory on, on this brand transformation. So I used to be the uh, former VP of brand over there at, at, the, at the network for several years, and I was part of the team that um, sort of propelled the network into being a top 10 cable network in the U.S. and helped to launch it across Europe. Well, it recently underwent a massive transformation by the Lab Creative Agency that I believe is just, to me, one of the most innovative network rebrands in years. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, but... <laughs> I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, but comedy had a problem. So while it was a, had a solid reputation with great shows, like South Park and The Daily Show, um, the shows were not being, being attributed to the network. And um, the content, when it went digital, it kind of lost its brand ownership. So, um, and, and like many networks, the ratings were declining, and they were losing their elusive target audience, which is the young male viewers. So comedy, as a genre, it's very social, but the brand was not behaving socially. They were a TV station that just talked to you one person at a time, you know, telling you when to tune in. And these old ways of television, they're just not what the consumer is. This is not how they interact today. And, um, and, and so the inspiration um, for the brand transformation kind of happened the moment that they decided to look at um, the content first. And, um, and then sort of in a more neutral way first, and then started from the digital presence and then began to grow from there. So um, the, the, the innovative team at the lab created something called a Comedy Central Packet. Uh, it was sort of a new device that it would live and be shared, and it would deliver content to the audience. Um, and so this new way of consuming and sharing the network content in a way, um, on any platform, it needed a new way for the viewers to identify it. So how can the logo 
um, travel with this content as it goes from YouTube to you know, any other platform that it might, it might end up on. So it became clear that they also needed a new logo mark to go along with this Comedy Central package. So they created what's called a Comedy Central mark. And it was inspired by the C that you see from a carousel, like the old um, uh, Kodak carousels. Um, when you look at it, it's sort of like this carousel of content, which is sort of how they, they thought about the, the content. Um, and so there was a C kind of surrounded by a backward C in its final presentation, and the mark kind of looked and acted like a copyright symbol. It effectively tagged every piece of content as Comedy Central's, whether it wherever it appears. I mean, it was just a very simple and effective way of, of um, sort of giving it this, this, this mark of approval. So the Comedy Central mark was born, and the old logo was gone. So in, in one of their IDs, which I, I just find to be so funny, they actually wrote this copy. Um, it says, um, we should explain. Our logo has changed. No longer do you see the big buildings in the globe that quite literally said Comedy Central on top of it. Please welcome our new logo mark. We affectionately call it the Comedy Mark. It works way fucking better than that old one that they used to have. Big building and globe, you served us well. But we've moved on. Thanks, Comedy Central. So I actually have this uh, opportunity to share with you guys the actual pitch presentation um, from th that the lab did to, to the network. And um, you know, it, it was so brilliantly done because it, it challenges all of the, um, the, the, the things that were in the creative brief, such as content ownership, um, content sharing, loss of ratings. Um, and they also showed all the elements and how the brand would look and feel and sound and move. Now keep in mind, this was just the pitch. And we all know the folks that you know, do pitches, you never get a chance to do something this thoroughly, thoroughly and actually work it all out in just the pitch phase. It has recently come to the attention of Comedy Central executives that the deployment of emergent forms of user-generated content by means of the so-called internet may provide significant top-line incentive, resulting in bottom-line reward. This is Comedy Central. That was a CC packet. A CC packet is social. Oh. You say anything about gambling. It's not gambling when you know you're going to win. Ready? It has recently come to the attention of Comedy Central executives that certain of our audience may be engaged in other value-related program activities at 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock Central Time. Hey! Where did you get those clothes? At the toilet store? A CC packet goes everywhere. I told you. I'm white, you know? I'm white. W H I T. E. A CC packet is ownable. Oh. CC packet is screen agnostic. <laughs> a CC packet is searchable. Yeah, it's, Any it's sport it's that involves. C okay, there's uh, Just take the money. I don't even care at this point. You know what? Take the flag. This is Comedy Central. It has recently come to the attention of Comedy Central executives that comedy is funny. Okay, next. All right. So the desired takeaway from this is that Comedy Central is just not a television channel, but it is a global content provider that's true to its brand and connects viewers with, uh, with comedy across all media. Now, of course, when it comes to um, successful branding, you've got to make that emotional connection uh, to the consumer. And how do, how do you do that? Well, you align your core values with the core values of your network. 
So now, um, if you were to ask me, um, how do I, um, oh, there you go. So if you were to ask me, uh, how do I stay true to my core values? Well, I thought about this, because you know, I want to show examples of everything I'm talking about here. So you know, as I mentioned, you know, there's the creative and there's the innovative stuff like that. So you know, and what does that mean? It means that I have to push myself to look at things differently all the time. And you know, even something that might be right in front of me, you know, it's like I got to challenge myself to say, how do I look at this different? How can I, you know? So what I did is I did a little experiment before I came here, and I said, okay, I'm going to just find something that's literally right in front of me, right? And I'm going to say, like, make it, you know, look at it differently, and, you know, let it help me tell the story of this branding and television. And so I thought, okay, how about my rings? <laughs> because they're right in front of me. <laughs> so, I mean, each one of them kind of looks like a character in a medieval movie, you know, but, I, you know, how can I use them to express this brand, and how can it help me tell, you know, to, to express innovations in television? Well, after some exploration and some innovation, I had a revelation, and I decided to let them tell the story themselves. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm not asking you to do like a ring puppet show in your kitchen table this weekend, but I am challenging you to look at things, you know, something that might be right in front of you, very obvious things, look at them a little bit differently. And you never know, it might lead to some interesting innovation. So now let's continue along our journey and take a look at a couple of other networks that saw some other things that were right in front of them a little bit differently in order to make some renewed emotional connections with their audience. So the first stop is VTM. Now, VTM is a commercial television network in Flanders, Belgium. Now, I didn't even know what Flanders was, I'm just going to ignore it, but when I saw this presentation, I thought it was fantastic. So, um, VTM is, uh, uh, the programming is about making those emotional connection. And since none of us are from Flanders, I just want to kind of give you an idea of what some of their programming is to set the mood. <laughs> has a relatively small market reaching about 6 million people and it's a general entertainment market with about 70% locally produced programming and it's a mix of reality and international acquisitions like The Voice and So You Think You Can Dance. You know, VTM, they tried to position themselves as strictly a family channel, but it was just too general. So the new position called for a deeper emotional connection with their audience. And, you know, knowing that was the key, they needed to find a new uh, brand strategy to match that. And they engaged Gédion uh, of, of Paris, 
uh, to help them to, to create that. So nowadays, we all know that the most connected and engaged consumers are on social media. And using social media as an inspiration for the brand transformation, they created something called talkability for VTM to literally connect with their audience. It was like a dialogue where both the channel and the viewers had a voice, sharing content and conversation. So in the end, VTM became the voice of the people and the, and the, and the voice of VTM, no, I'm sorry. VTM became the voice of the people and the voice of the people became VTM. So the brand promise of talkability informed a whole new approach to both promos, graphic designs, um, and how it communicated with its, it, it, with its audience. So let's first take a look at the promos and how that was changed. Old programming content, it, you know, it needed to be looked at through this new fresh eyes uh, of this new relationship with the audience. So how do you promote the 10th or 11th airing of, say, Titanic, you know, uh, on the network? The solution? Well, you engage your viewers to promote it. Oops. Ah. Right, one more. Uh, play. There you go. I'm flying. Check out what they did for Batman. <laughs> I am Batman! <laughs> so, the promo not only communicates tune in, you know, loud and clear, um, but it reinforces the brand's core values. BTM is a family channel, so imagine how parents feel when they see something like this. The brand becomes more friendly, it's more authentic, and it keeps, the, the, it, keeps it fresh. It's not about just an identity, it, it's, it's a language that connects with the audience, whether they're you know, promoting dramas or reality shows or popular competition shows like this. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. En deze gorilla krijgt van ons een ticket naar de finale. Maar onze dansers moeten zich eerst nog bewijzen tijdens het eerste bootcamp. Hier is So You Think You Can Dance. Open Gangnam Style. So, now this user-generated content keeps the brand so fresh and full of surprises. It literally evolves with the audience which, as we all know, is the only way for a brand to stay relevant. But it's not all about fun and games. The beauty about talkability is that it allows a dialogue to come about when something important happens in the community. So when the Ford uh, company in Belgium closed, it, it affected thousands of people. Like a trusted friend, the brand needed to respond. Verbijstering en verdriet vandaag in heel het land. Sterkte aan alle getroffen werknemers en hun families. But now this system of talk bubbles, it, it's more than just a, a graphic treatment. It's a brand promise that can engage viewers like the network was never able to do before. VTM took, the, took to the streets during New Year's um, to find out what was on the hearts and minds of its audience. People wrote their own personal messages for the new year. And in one day, they created about 50 new idents for the channel. It looked and sounded something like this.
I love that. So um, we looked at promos. Now let's look a little bit closer at how talkability informed the logo. So now the VTM logo design had gone through several sort of iterations over the, uh, oops, oh, no, come on, and play. No, it's not playing. Okay, anyway, we'll skip that one. Um, the VTM logo underwent several uh, iterations over, over the years. And, uh, but in order for the uh, visual, visual um, language to reinforce talkability, um, it also had to, it, the logo also had to, to evolve. So if the, um, the new brand was responsive to what was happening around it, um, the brand itself had to speak. So inspired by social media and text messaging, Jadion created a talk bubble within the VTM logo. And they looked at it in every single angle of the logo and actually explored, I'm, I'm a, such a design geek, so I'm sorry, I'm like really getting into this stuff. Um, so they, they, and they, they found these three forms that existed within the negative space around the logo. And it was this very, very simple idea um, of, of talkability um, that kind of gave them everything they needed. These forms can accommodate all sorts of, of, of messages and, and images and a window into content. So just by seeing things a little bit differently, um, they were able to innovate the, the, the channel. Um, so I'm just going to show you really quickly what the brand looks like in action. I heard about this frog. It's a very tiny frog, but it's also very special. So we're going to continue on our journey now. We're going to go halfway across the world to New York City, where Fuse TV also did a multi-platinum, multi-platinum, um, multi-platform rebrand that, like VTN, the voice of the audience became the driving force for inspiration. Now, Fuse is one of the few, re few remaining music channels left in the U.S., and its programming consists of mostly music videos, shows, specials, and um, some long-form content. But its target audience is one of the most difficult to hold on to, those ever-elusive millennials. Those are those short attention span having, multi-screen viewing, 15 to 30-year-olds who live and breathe technology. You know, they share and consume music unlike any other group. The problem, of course, we all know, millennials can access what music wherever and whatever they want, just by just the click of a button. Uh, on both the linear and um, the digital platform. So the content has to be fresher, and the viewer experience has to be more engaging. So Fuse was really fragmented, and it didn't have any brand strategy to inform the look and feel of the language of the brand. The solution, of course, define your core audience, create an engaging viewer experience with a unique visual and editorial voice that emotionally connects with the audience. Easier said than done, of course. Um, so, this, in, in order to appeal to this target audience, um, they connected with Loyal Casper of New York. 
And um, the new brand attributes needed to be conversational and social. It had to be informational and authentic, yet approachable and inviting, you know, more like a trusted friend um, that shares their passion and enthusiasm for music rather than kind of talking down to them. Um, but most of all, it had to be unconventional. Um, you know, the inspiration for this brand transformation came with the celebration and integration of millennial communication. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, so let's look, take a look at uh, how Loyal Casper turned this, this, uh, this brand around. Um, they created something called Mission Control first. Um, uh, mission Control was sort of like an in-programming, uh, uh, in-program message system, um, and they were able to, um, I'm sorry, if Fuse is the center of music, then the bug needed to be at the center of the screen. Now, you know, that may not be unconventional here, but in the States, all of our bugs are on the one side of the screen. Um, so simple, but yet unconventional, that all the communication came and originated from the Fuse bug. Now, knowing that, of course, social media is so important to the way millennials communicate, um, they also needed ways to, to sort of stay in the know. And so Fuse had to react and reflect that as well. So an intricate system of lower thirds and um, playlists and, um, you know, uh, trending information. And even when it came to actually uh, promoting the network, they used these sort of disruptive um, lower thirds. Now, and uh, keep in mind, we're talking about music videos here, you know, this, so we don't have to worry about this delicate balance between content and, and, and graphics. Um, the next thing they also wanted to explore was the voice of the network. And, you know, they needed an authentic voice and, um, and communicate and the commu communication style that was critical in connecting with this audience. Because we all know that, you know, millennials, and they will tell you this, that they are so allergic to bullshit. Like, when they actually see it coming, they run. So, um, so Fuse had to actually eliminate that typical marketing language. No more of that brought to you by and for more information go to and they replaced it with more authentic and conventional communication, the way millennials communicate. So um, they use abbreviated language like thanks when they were talking about, you know, sponsorship integration, um, next up when they're talking about, you know, um, uh, navigational and later. And then when they really wanted to make a point, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so um, Next, they also wanted to eliminate voiceovers and promos. I mean, after all, you know, on, on, when, you're when you're tweeting and then you're on Facebook, there's no voiceover, right? So um, they actually, instead, they created a set, of, um, a set of very smart toolkits that would utilize type and convey all the information and messaging and attitude. Um, this completely innovated the way, uh, the, uh, way the promo team had to work and operate and challenged them to think a lot differently. So just here's a quick example of what one of their promos looks and sounds like. <laughs> Now, a lot of the visual fragmentation that I was talking about earlier was because of the show packages. They all had their own look. And so this is kind of what it looked like before. It's kind of all over the place. And this is what it looked like after. It kept with a much more cohesive look. Um, they created show packages, um, a, a show package toolkit that reinforced the Fuse brand and allowed the diversity to come from the hosts and the show content itself. And that was also another sort of network innovation. Um, they, they had these customized elements that would cover everything from, you know, countdown modules to mortises and all of that stuff. And the result is, of course, which is for the bottom line, was that with a toolkit like this, there was no more having to go out and create all these unique um, show opens. So literally the cost of, of show opens went from an average of $30,000 to about $5,000. And let's take a look at Fuse in action. Yeah. 
So I've got uh, one more brand to talk to you guys about, Cadillac. So Cadillac is one of the oldest luxury automobile brands in the U.S., but they had an image problem. People stopped associating Cadillac with luxury. There was this perception that the cars were not that great, and during these sort of, you know, hard economic times, people were not rushing out to buy these luxury brands anyway. So over time, Cadillac became known as like your grandfather's car, and you know, there was nothing sexy about it, and um, its target audience was literally like getting old and almost becoming extinct. So how does an American brand survive its darkest days? And even more important, how do you revive a classic American brand? Well, to make this more challenging, um, the agency BBH, um, headed by the creative team of uh, Johnson & Wilberton, had to create conceive and execute a full multi-platform um, relaunch of an entire new Cadillac line in just a few short months. So inspired by the Cadillac Shield, um, they created and developed an entirely new uh, innovative brand language, and it was the largest production that General Motors had ever done in history. So the question is, how did they do it? This new brand uh, attribute, the new brand attributes had to convey uh, confidence, uh, beauty, advanced technology, um, uh, uh, and leadership status. The brand needed to appeal to a whole new audience. Uh, it had to feel younger and sexier and cooler. Um, uh, it technologically advanced yet impeccably, um, technologically advanced yet impec impeccably designed, the car uh, represented the perfect balance between two opposing, opposing forces, and that is art and science. And this became the inspiration for their brand transformation. So the creative team, um, they locked themselves in the room for like 12 hour days for a, an entire month, creating what, what they called these brand sketches. And uh, these brand sketches, using sound design and, and, and graphic design uh, and animation and editing, each would explore this idea of art and science and see how it supported these new, the, new, the new brand attributes. Um, they asked themselves, if Cadillac were a brand, how would it move? Uh, if, it were, uh, um, if it were a band, how would it sound? So this process and, and, and attention to detail, I just found to be so fascinating that, that they would work all this out um, prior to even presenting um, uh, the creative. And you know, this is, I just want you to take a listen to what just one of their, um, their, their brand sketches was, with just sound design alone. So by the time they were ready to pitch this, they had everything all worked out. They had all the movement, the design, the print, everything was already pitched out. So I'm just going to show to you exactly what their pitch presentation was that actually uh, awarded them this project. This is the power of two opposing forces. This is the art and science of Cadillac. Two disciplines under one roof. Dynamic and opposite. When 
brought together, things happen. And something greater than each results. Through art and science, we will become the standard of the world again. Through art and science, we will rebuild our reputation. One line at a time. One car at a time. This is the art and science of Cadillac. This is our mark of leadership. Okay, so I gotta wrap this up. I kinda went over time a little bit, so I can't show you this last piece I wanted to show you, but I just wanna say that, um, you know, whether you're working on your personal brand or your channel brand, um, that the same rules apply. And I hope you enjoyed this little journey and got to get a little inspiration and, and um, motivation to do some exploration into your brand rejuvenation. Um, if you look at things with a little different expectation, it could lead to a revelation and ultimately some great innovation. Thank you. Thank you.